In November 2000, a criminal gang attempted the most audacious robbery in British history. They looked like terrorists. We're watching it on CCTV. The target, the world's most perfect diamond, the De Beers Millennium Star. We didn't know exactly how they were going to do it and we didn't know when they were going to do it. The robbers' daring plan would bring untold riches for decades behind bars. The police operation against them would be the biggest in the Flying Squad's history. We were actually ready for a war, quite frankly. Using never-before-seen police footage and testimony from the men who were there, this is the inside story of the heist of the millennium and the secret operation to foil it. London's Millennium Dome, scene of the biggest diamond raid in British history. It was a story that made headlines around the world, but for the police, it all began nine months earlier. In February 2000, flying squad officers based at New Scotland Yard received reports of a dramatic incident three miles away in Battersea. For John Shatford, the squad's head, it marked the start of the biggest case of his career. I could hear down the corridor from my office a lot of activity on the radio. And with that, Lindsay um, came running down and said, I think there's a terrorist explosion or something is happening at Nine Elms, but it might be a robbery. I said, well, I've got to get there. Shatford and his team raced to Nine Elms Lane, a busy main road that hugs the south bank of the Thames. When he arrived, he was faced with total devastation. It just looked like the scene of a, of a street in Iraq or something. And then picking around what had actually happened there, you could see this was something quite exceptional. It soon became clear that this was not a terrorist attack, but a failed armed raid. In their attempt to steal the cash from the armoured car, the gang had built a fearsome weapon fixed to the back of a lorry. One of the vehicles the robbers were going to use was like a self-made battering ram. It was a flatbed lorry, and on the back they'd welded this big spike, and the intention was to ram it into the back of the security van, open it up and take the cash. Now! Get the door! The £10 million robbery was only prevented when a driver blocked in by the gang's lorry took their keys in anger without realising a raid was taking place. When they went to get this battering ram and get in the lorry, of course the keys are missing and they can't do it and they can't go through with it. With their battering ram put out of action, the frustrated gang set fire to their vehicles then escaped on foot to the nearby Thames. They had a boat waiting on the water for them, an inflatable dinghy. They jumped on that and they were away the other side of the water towards Chelsea and somehow got away. The police had never witnessed such a sophisticated raid and unusual getaway before. The robbers had left them with nothing to go on. It was meticulously planned, both in their execution and also their attempts to prevent the police gathering forensic evidence, i.e. by exploding the vehicles that were used in the job. With no suspects and no forensics, the flying squad decided to focus on the gang's distinctive means of escape, the getaway across the river. This was a unique in my experience. I mean, the fact that they were going to use a boat to escape in this way. So from there, really, we went back to Scotland Yard and started looking what other cash depots around the country might be near a, a river where this plan could be used again. For the police, the well-planned operation meant only one thing. The gang were going to strike again. From then, it was like a ticking clock. This was only a matter of time. Armed and masked robbers used a van equipped with a steel spike to ram the Securicor van early today. Aylesford in Kent. This time, the masked gang got even nearer to the cash. 
they were within seconds of grabbing the money when an unexpected vehicle appeared on the scene. And a police car that happened to be passing interrupted them. They shot at the police and they made good their escape by driving down to a very close river, the River Medway, and away on a speedboat. The robbery and the getaway bore the same hallmarks as the Nine Elms raid. And any lingering doubts that the gang were one and the same were soon dispelled. On the Nine Elms raid, one of the robbers uh, rather humorously had written the word Gertie on uh, the spike. Down in Kent, it could have been a carbon copy. On the back of that spike was written Gertie 2 and then just below it, a sign saying, Persistent Aren't We? So there was no doubt in my mind whatsoever that this was the same team involved. But the robbers' overconfidence was badly misplaced. Within hours of the Kent raid, the police would get a lucky break that would unmask the identity of one gang member and eventually uncover the plot to seize the world's most precious diamonds. Within minutes of the Aylesford hold-up, police knew they were dealing with the same gang who'd used a lorry-mounted spike in the Nine Elms raid. And within hours, they got the first clue to one of the robbers' identities. It came from a constable in Kent CID. He had been reviewing newspapers on the day of the Aylesford robbery, and when he was looking at the photographs, he actually thought he recognised the flatbed lorry on which the spike was. The officer had recently investigated reports of stolen vehicles being stored at an isolated small holding called Tong Farm. So he went back through his intelligence and he found that uh, that vehicle he'd seen going into Tong Farm a month or so previously. Tong Farm was owned and run by a family called the Wenhams. 33-year-old Lee Wenham, a scrap metal dealer, was well known to the police. He was notorious down in Kent. Not particularly high calibre, but a certain nuisance down there. So when we did get on to this, it's just hopeful now that we might have a base for where the criminals were operating from. With the gang possibly linked to Tong Farm, the Flying Squad and Kent Police launched a joint surveillance operation. For weeks, the comings and goings were closely monitored. This police video taken at the time shows Lee Wenham's truck leaving and arriving. Stolen vehicles, including this yellow JCB digger, were also recorded. But more important were these images. Wenham had company. We didn't exactly know who they were, but they appeared to be these heavy criminals that we thought had probably come from London. The visitors were later identified as Ray Betson and Bill Cockrum career criminals, well known to London detectives. That was a real eureka moment, because when we realised we had someone of the pedigree of Betson, someone that we considered to be extremely dangerous, and uh, someone with the capability and wherewithal to plan the job of this calibre, and that really started to put this on a totally new level. Despite his reputation, Betson had relatively few criminal convictions. Cockrum was uh, Betson's right-hand man, his lieutenant. If you were to see him in the street, he's just a, a middle-aged man. But once again, you know, amongst the criminal community, uh, Cockrum himself had a presence as well. Police may have spotted Betson and Cockrum at the farm, but they had no evidence linking them to the armed robberies. It wasn't until they identified the driver of this van that another piece of the jigsaw fell into place. His name was Terence Millman. Millman himself was an armed robber with a formidable record. Millman was not only known to the police, he enjoyed respect in London's underworld. 
Detectives were now confident they had the key members of the gang. Betson, the career criminal. Cochrane, the number two. The experienced Millman. And providing them all with a base, Lee Wenham. If the police needed more proof, it came on the 25th of August, when their cameras filmed the arrival of a familiar getaway vehicle. One of the most significant moments was when we actually saw a boat being taken into Tong Farm because it told us that we were looking at the right place and that these were people who were preparing for the next job. But the police had no idea where that next job would be and for the moment could only rely on guesswork. We've actually had um, officers deputed to actually gather as much intelligence as they could around potential targets that might be at risk. And we drew up plans around possible locations at that time. It really was that wide at that moment. And it was only by sort of networking resources that we could actually drive this forward. The Flying Squad and Kent Police met regularly to pool intelligence. At one of these meetings, it emerged that Lee Wenham, rather than planning an armed robbery, appeared to be organising a family day out. Lee Wenham was looking to purchase a, uh, a family ticket, uh, and the, the price of the family ticket, I believe, was around about £58. Yeah. And uh, we researched that, and the intelligence picked up that the cost of a family ticket to go to the Dome was £58. The Millennium Dome in Greenwich was the site of the largest exhibition in Britain. But throughout the year 2000, it made headlines for all the wrong reasons. Massive overspends, poor attendances and critical reviews had dogged it since day one. So was at least someone's visiting the Dome. And it started to, to sound a bit odd. Well, why would he go to the Dome? You know, it's, it's on the news every night that not enough people are going. And someone just threw out, it was a, a DI who was at Greenwich, just threw out across the, unless they're going to steal the Millennium Diamond. The diamond, known as the Millennium Star, was the centrepiece of a £350 million De Beers exhibition. This dazzling collection would make a tempting target for any determined robber. I remember it, it suddenly hit me. I thought, my God. And I visualised that river, the Thames, bending around the dome. And it's something that you really, really want to be true. Because it's actually so extraordinary that you think this would be absolutely sensational. If the gang were planning to rob the diamonds, the flying squad would need to follow Wenham's every move during his upcoming visit to the Dome. To do so, they used a cover story to infiltrate an officer into its CCTV control room. We managed to get Sean Allen to go into the control room, look at the cameras, uh, purporting to be looking for uh, drug dealers. That cover story enabled us to turn cameras, focus cameras, zero in on people, and we kept up the pretense for quite a while that we were actually, I'd say, looking for street dealers who were plying their trade. On the day of the visit, Wenham left the farm accompanied by a woman and a child. As he arrived at the dome, he had no idea he was being watched. I was controlling the cameras inside and outside. We identified Wenham walking round the dome. Wenham was filmed checking possible access points to the site. Once inside the dome, surveillance officers dressed as tourists got within 10 yards of their target. Totally unaware of their presence, Wenham was filmed visiting the diamond vault no fewer than three times. The alarm bell started to ring because we then had a boat in a farm. We had the dome, which was near a waterborne escape route. And we saw that Wenham did, in fact, appear to have more than passive interest in the vault like a tourist. We knew, therefore, what the target was, and we could start planning a response around that. 
The plan to foil the raid became known as Operation Magician, the biggest undertaking in the Flying Squad's history. But circumstantial evidence would not be enough. To ensure convictions, John Shatford would have to catch the gang in the very act of robbing the jewels. Now, I've had armed robbers that have been um, dressed up in, in, in masks, been carrying guns, and actually still got off at the trial because they've been able to convince the jury that they were there for another purpose. So you actually let the robbers go so far and then arrest them so that what, you know, their intentions are actually irrefutable. To catch the gang red-handed, the flying squad needed to find out when the diamonds would be at their most vulnerable. And to do this, they would have to inform the diamonds' owners about the robbery plot. I was sitting in my office when the phone rang and it was a policeman on the end there who didn't really introduce himself very clearly, but he'd like to speak to me. And I was met and he said to me, we have reasons to believe that, that there are a bunch of villains who are coming together who are going to try to steal the Millennium Star. Thorne was initially sceptical. The Millennium Collection was housed in an impregnable vault. We had built there a, a fort, literally, of solid concrete, solid doors that nobody could break into. But having said that, the doors had to be opened for the general public. And that is why the display cabinets themselves, that glass was supposed to be uh, unbreakable, that it would stand up to at least a half an hour of any demented person who was prepared to smash away with any known device. Shatford agreed that a raid on the vault was unlikely. He expected the robbery to occur when the diamond was in transit. Looking at what happened at Nine Elms, looking what happened at Aylesford, we're pretty certain that they must be going to rob the diamond when it's en route somewhere. And talking to Tim, he said, well, actually, it's going to be moved to uh, Tokyo on display. In early September, the diamonds were due to be driven from the dome to De Beers London headquarters before being taken to an exhibition in Japan. Suddenly, that was it. Well, if this is the only time it's being moved, the gang must have inside information from somewhere and they must be going to hit this on the 1st of September. The flying squad now scrambled to put together the biggest ambush in their history. John Shatford decided on overwhelming force in his quest to catch the Diamond Raiders in the act. We had the entire river covered with our river launches, and I must have had close to 300 people at the end of the day either dug in around the dome or watching. We're putting people up at cranes around the dome, so we had absolutely everywhere covered. We were actually ready for a war, quite frankly. We could take on anything. At dawn on the 1st, security staff removed the priceless diamonds from the dome's vault. Replicas were then displayed in their place. At 6am, the armoured convoys set off. We got word that the um, security vehicles are now going to move away, and they're on their way. So I had a helicopter in the air, standing off at distance and we were waiting, well, where is it going to happen? John Shatford had identified the Blackwall Tunnel, which connects the Dome to the City of London on the north side of the Thames as the most likely place for the gang to strike. As the security van entered the tunnel, the police held their breath. We waited and we waited. We followed that all the way back to De Beers headquarters in the city of London. Nothing happened. And when it arrived in those gates and I got the message back to where I was at the dome, that that's it, um, it's back, safe, no untoward incident. I just went away in a corner and I thought, what's happened? The police operation had cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. The gang, had simply not shown up. And I went back to Scotland Yard and I went and shut myself in my office 
And I just sunk my head in the hands and I thought, what the hell? You know, where, how else can how else can they possibly do it? They absolutely could not do it inside the dome. They just, just couldn't possibly do that. It's perhaps it's never going to happen. And that was probably the lowest ever. But just as Operation Magician teetered on the brink of disaster, Shatford received some stunning news. It came from the undercover officer who was manning the dome's security cameras. I've got a call from Sean Allen who said something like, Boss, you're not going to believe this. But I just spotted Betson and Cochrane at the dome. And they're having a good eyeball at the diamond. You could see Ray Betson and William Cochrane walking around the dome. And I was euphoric because we had actually seen them still there. So for us, the job was still on. The gang appeared unaware that the real diamonds had left the country and that the stones in the vault were mere replicas. We were more confident that they did not have an inside agent because otherwise they would have known that these diamonds would have moved at that time. And he's talking me through it, he's telling me what's happened and I could feel myself lifting and thinking, my God, it's still on. And not only that, it's still on, but Christ, this means, this can only mean they're going to do it inside the dome. Such an audacious plan was not what the man in charge of the dome wanted to hear. I was not a happy bunny at all, and I was not ready to cooperate, and I, I very openly said, you know, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to do everything in my power to stop you do this, you know, because I don't care. This is my world, this is my tent, these are my people. You know, it could have been the biggest bloodbath ever. Then, of course, we have to put another perspective on that and say, well, look, hang on. This gang is very, very dangerous. We now have an opportunity to arrest them in a properly controlled environment with irrefutable evidence. Now, if we fail on this occasion, how can you explain? Well, we actually did have an opportunity to arrest this team and put them out of the way, but it was too dangerous, so, so we didn't do it. We're the police. There is no one else. Um, and, and, and this guy really kind of, you know, let me blow smoke and just calm me down and just turn me around and convince me this is, this is gonna be good, this is gonna be all right. As senior officers gained clearance for their armed ambush, undercover colleagues kept their targets under surveillance. And that would soon unmask a fifth member of the gang. This police footage shows Betson and Cockrum in a Bermondsey car park meeting a man later identified as Aldo Kirochi. Kirochi, a failed property developer with a taste for the finer things in life, seemed an unlikely armed robber. I don't know if he came over as a playboy, he certainly was not of the same uh, Robert Ilk as the rest of them. Um, more educated um, and he would have been the odd one out in the pack, but he had a role to play as well. With five of the gang identified, the police now concentrated their surveillance on the getaway vehicle. Because we knew the robbery would involve a boat, for that reason, if we stayed with the boat, we would get the ultimate target. We could never be 100% sure that they weren't planning a secondary target, maybe to move on to. So for that reason, to minimize the risk of compromising the operation, we played it safe and we stayed on the boat. As the robbers tested the speedboat, the watching police noticed it was not performing as it should. On the 3rd of October, officers followed Terence Millman to a boatyard in Whitstable, Kent. Glasses, beard, horizontal stripes, jumper. There he paid cash for a replacement boat. Reversing towards the gates of the boatyard. The boat is being manoeuvred towards the back of the transit. When police recovered the receipt, 
they found that it signed for the purchase using the name Terry Diamond. But while detectives were sure the boat would be used for the getaway, they were baffled by the other unusual vehicle they'd seen the gang testing. The yellow JCB. We identified that the robbery gang would use a JCB in some part of this robbery. We did not have any idea what they would use it for. But officers were confident that the date of the raid was drawing near. The gang's activity was increasing. And on October the 6th, the JCB was tailed from Tong Farm to a derelict coal yard in Plumstead, South London. Contact, contact, the JCB. This secluded place, just a few miles from the dome, was to become the forward operations post for the gang. And with the real diamonds back at the dome after the Japanese tour, the stakes could not be higher. There's this general air that we must be getting close to the robbery taking place. The gang carried out some form of work on it. There was a lot of banging, I think some welding. We didn't know what was taking place. And indeed, we did not know what this was being used for. But it was a mystery throughout. What on earth are they going to do? Not knowing how or when the gang would strike presented the police with huge logistical problems. They had to keep an expensive 24-hour presence in and around the dome, while all the time keeping it secret from the gang. We used cover stories that we were doing a training exercise in the local area. Our main concern was that the, the robbers, for want of a better word, would start putting the dome into the too hard box and would start looking for a softer target that they could control better. As the secret stakeout at the Millennium Dome continued, surveillance officers began to notice new patterns in the gang's visits. As autumn progressed, they only seemed to turn up at certain times on certain days. The gang had been to the Dome on a number of occasions. And we were starting to look at this and the dates that were involved. And then it turned out that every time they were there coincided with when the Thames was at a high tide. We had a survey done of the river by a uh, Thames branch who actually indicated to us that there was only so many spots along the Thames where a boat could be put in or taken out of. And there was only about a 30 minute window of opportunity on every tide. We could then look on the calendar and follow the same date, so whenever it was a high tide, I could deploy and in, in strength. The next high tide was due at 9.30 a.m. on Monday, November the 6th. At this time of day, the dome and its diamond vault would be open to the public. As Shatford prepared his men, he knew that any mistakes would have far-reaching consequences. If we got this wrong, we're talking here, the, the reputation of the Metropolitan Police, maybe its ability ever to carry on and, and tackle crime in, in this way again. I always knew that this is going to be the end of certainly my career if this goes wrong. At 2 a.m. on the 6th of November, Shatford deployed his units at the Dome. What we had to do was, was smuggle people in, firearms officers, flying squad officers, surveillance officers, in the back of furniture remover, lorries, or, or whatever we um, chose to use. And, you know, we were talking about probably 100 people at a time. Some of our officers went in um, pretending to be employees of the Dome. Some donned cleaning uniforms, some donned um, tour guide-style uniform. I had firearms officers dressed as cleaners. They had their weapons in, in bin liners moving around. Shatford and his assistants took their place in the Dome's CCTV control room and waited. At 10 to 7, the first reports came in that the JCB was leaving its hideout. Nicholas on the move towards the gates. As it was getting lighter, we're getting reports, yeah, the JCB, there's movement down at the coal yard. 
So I thought, this is it. It's all coming now. Let's just, just prepare for this. And, and, and let's just get ready. But as the police waited, they suffered a stroke of bad luck that threatened to wreck the whole operation. And then just as we're getting reports, yeah, they must be close, there's an accident outside the front of the dome. We thought, oh, no, no. The police are called, and we have a traffic car there, blue lights flashing, and, um, it, uh, worst nightmare. I, can, I was just pacing around the room, thinking, no, no, I just can't believe this. Spooked by the police car, the JCB turned back and the boat withdrew. At the last minute, the raid was off. Well, they've seen the police, that's it. That must be the end of it. End of story. And, and we're finished. Although Shatford thought he'd blown his final opportunity, he decided to have one last look at the tidal charts. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, we've only got the high tide for we're looking at the maps again. And, you know, you, you, you try to find virtue in anything when you're up against it. And we thought, well, I suppose you could argue that the tide is slightly higher tomorrow, so it might be that they will go again. The next morning's high tide would be Shatford's last chance. Not only was the spiralling cost of the huge operation raising eyebrows at the Home Office, but the police had also received news that the operation may have been leaked to the media. Keeping the plan secret for much longer would be impossible. So I thought, we will deploy tonight, we've got to. And I briefed the officers that night, um, knowing that this is out there, of course, that there are people in the media that know about this, and this truly is the last shot we've got at this. I say, look, we've been so close, so close, but this is the one. Let's be on our job here. You're going to need to come through. On the morning of the 7th, officers were again positioned along the route from the coal yard and dug in on the north side of the river. Armed officers in speedboats and police helicopters were also ready and waiting. A hidden ring of steel was now in place around the dome, the vault and the diamonds. And then the early morning comes and we get a report through that um, there was activity at the coal yard. And then we got reports that the boat was on the move. Police cameras picked up Millman at the wheel. The boat came down the A13 to be positioned on the far side of the Thames, the north side of the Thames. Boat driver is looking at the engine of the boat. The JCB's getting close, it's at the top of the roundabout. And as they're getting very much closer, and then another report go, the boat is on the water, it's just going to drive by. This is it. At 9.29 a.m., as the first tourists were arriving, the JCB, driven by Betson, with three other robbers hidden in the modified cab, was spotted on the final approach road to the dome. It negotiated its way very slowly through the sand and gravel pits that ran adjacent to the dome. took up a holding position without breaching the, the perimeter of the dome's outside fence. I asked the security at the dome to call certain members of staff for a meeting so we could put ourselves in place. Police officers are gradually taking over from dome staff. And then what happens but a coach load of children turn up right where we think the robbers are going. It was worst nightmare scenario. The robbers are just minutes away. And as quick as anything, I mean, we got people down there and we just whisked them away. Just moments later, at 9.33 a.m., the robbers struck. We've actually got it, we're watching it on CCTV. 
I can see it now. It starts to rock backwards and forwards. And you think, what's that? It's getting up its strength. Then Betsy accelerates hard with the JCB and takes out a, a reinforced concrete pillar that enables him to then crash through the fence. It was an incredible sight to see. Even at that point, we had no idea that they were going to go this far with the JCB. And then they smashed straight through a 10, 15 foot gate. And then, to our absolute horror, they turned and went straight through the side wall of the dome. As the JCB careered onwards, the boat began its run towards the dome's landing stage. Yeah, first stop off towards the dome, towards the pier. The JCB came into the dome itself and then parked directly outside the vault, and then they jumped out of the JCB. Look like terrorists, quite frankly, but they had these breathing apparatus on. Karachi started throwing smoke grenades out. Amid the confusion, two of the robbers ran into the vault. Tim Thorne, watching via video link from De Beers headquarters, was horrified by what happened next. It looked to me that they were carrying sledgehammers and also something looked like a gun, and fired this gun-shaped thing into the side of the, of the actual display case itself. Thorne's confidence in the strength of the reinforced glass was about to be shattered. The other person picked up the sledgehammer and started to hammer away at where the gun had been fired, and it became quite clear that they were now making quite a considerable hole into the side of our display cabinet. After months of frustration, the moment Shatford had been waiting for had arrived. Myself and John Swinfield looked at each other and I can remember we just nodded and, you know, we were agreeing, the time is right, send in the boys. The gang had been under surveillance for five months. The ambush was over in less than a minute. Now it was time for the interrogations and the trial. Although the police had deployed massive force to foil the robbery, the operation passed without a single casualty. I'm waiting to hear that we've shot someone. I got the message, no one injured. And I thought, it's here, we've done it. Betson and Kirochi were arrested outside the vault. They gave up without any resistance at all. They were overwhelmed by the police response and the fact that uh, action beats reaction. Inside the vault, police armed with stun grenades overpowered Cockrum and an accomplice. When you're inside a concrete bunker, basically, and this is what it was, uh, then you can imagine the explosion and the, the force of the pressure wave from the explosion. And you can see them just toppled down as if they'd been poleaxed. The mystery accomplice who wielded the sledgehammer was later identified as Robert Adams, a man with a conviction for attempted murder. Mr. Adams found time to make a joke of the situation that he was in. Immediately after arrest, he said that he was 12 inches from payday. Out on the river, the getaway driver, Kevin Meredith, was swamped by armed officers. 
he must have thought his life was over, quite frankly, and he was, he was arrested very quickly. Terence Millman was arrested on the north side of the river, disguised as a workman, waiting for the getaway boat that never arrived. When police later arrested Lee Wenham at Tong Farm, the team could finally relax. John Swinfield and I went and, and congratulated each other. We've won, you know, for all the setbacks we've pulled this off. The Flying Squad's biggest operation had ended in stunning success. With the spectacular ambush taking place in public, front page headlines were guaranteed. The police have described the raid as audacious, potentially the biggest robbery in history. Almost exactly a year later came the trial. The court heard how sophisticated the robbers' plan had been. The judge did ask me uh, what did I think of, uh, of their attempt, and I told him I thought it was exceptional and it was brilliantly executed. And as I said, that all the crooks had the thumbs up as if, uh, well done, that's exactly what we thought as well. But of course they'd been trapped. It emerged that Cockrum had used an industrial nail gun to weaken the supposedly unbreakable glass around the diamond. I don't know, quite know how they knew that those um, nail guns would able, uh, able to penetrate that glass. But it did, it worked perfectly. Ten seconds, they got a hole into the glass. It was revealed that Robert Adams had only joined the gang the night before the raid. That sounds very strange to me. Someone must have pulled out who had knowledge of it and had to be placed, placed a man. In an attempt to reduce the charge of armed robbery to one of simple theft, defence lawyers argued that the gang had not used firearms on the raid. The main crux of the robber's defence at court was that uh, they didn't have any weapons. They were trying to portray that they were no more than accomplished shoplifters doing a smash and grab. The reality was the level of planning, their appearance, the fact that they looked like paramilitaries, the fact that they were going to use this JCB as a tank effectively, all uh, didn't uh, cut in the eyes of the jury and they quite clearly brought in the right verdict. Dome Raiders Ray Betson and Billy Cockrum were today jailed for 18 years for their part in the attempted robbery of the Millennium Star. Fellow gang members Aldo Carocci and Robert Adams got 15 years. The boat driver Kevin Meredith got five years for conspiracy to steal. Lee Wenham received four years for his role in the dome robbery and a further nine for the Aylesford heist. No other gang member has ever stood trial for either the Aylesford or the Nine Elms raid. Terence Millman died of cancer in prison while awaiting trial. In the years that have followed the trial, one rumor about the robbery has refused to go away. Had the gang been working for someone else? I was just managing to pick up whispers that possibly there's a Russian connection and that this is where the diamond was going to go, that I couldn't actually, you know, grip, that, that there was something bigger. You know, my own belief is that, that there were other people involved. Speculation, but well-informed speculation, I think. There is one final twist to the tale of the great dome diamond robbery. It's since emerged that before the gang struck, the Millennium Star's owners, De Beers, swapped their priceless stone for a valueless replica. So after all the months of planning, even if the robbers had succeeded, their haul would have been worth precisely nothing. Discover the turning points of forensic science in brand new crimes that changed history, starting on Monday at 9. Next up, the truth about marijuana.